on 16th of October 1951, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was shot at close range by a chap by the name of Said Akbar, son of Babrak of oh, Spargil Jadran. He was an Afghan national of Khosht in Afghanistan. The Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan died. However, on 14th of August 1951, in Jangir Park in Lahore, Liaquat Ali Khan said, I have neither wealth nor property, and I am glad for these things weaken faith. I have only my life, which I have dedicated long ago to my people and my country, and then when the need arises, I assure you, I will not lag behind others to shed my blood for Pakistan. This is exactly what happened. This post is about the politics of Liaquat Ali Khan. And what did he really stand for? Although we will start with a chronology of his uh, illustrious life. He was born on 1st of August at Karnal, East Punjab and he received his education in Quran, Sunnah and reading, writing, arithmetic and this was 1898. In 1909, he went to Aligarh MAO Collegiate School for regular education and he was at Aligarh from 1909 to 1919. Thence, in 1919, he went to England in September. In 1921, he took his master's degree from Exeter College, Oxford University, and took up the Honours School of Jurisprudence. In 1922, he completed his term in the Inner Temple and was called to Bar. In 1923, he came back to India and started his political life and joined the All India Muslim League in 1924. Meaning <clears throat> that uh, he joined Muslim League at a very young age. He was elected member of the UP Legislative Council in 1926 and he remained there till 1940. Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was not a man lacking in political experience. He was elected the Honorary General Secretary of All India Muslim League at Bombay session in April 1936 and Mr. Jinnah himself moved the resolution which was unanimously carried out. He continued to hold this office from 1936 to 1947. Uh, which basically shows uh, that he was uh, from the beginning to the to the to this very last a believer in the uh, politics of the Muslim League. One important thing about Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was that uh, he had a lot of political experience. And uh, he had uh, complete confidence of Mr. Jinnah. And uh, in 1939, Mr. Jinnah wrote in his will that I appoint my sister Fatma Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Chaiwala, solicitor Bombay, and Nawab Zada Liaquat Ali Khan of Delhi as my executrix and executors and also my trustees. Uh, Mr. Chaiwala opted out of it for personal reasons and so Mohtarma uh, Fatima Jinnah and Liaquat Ali Khan were the two trustees of his state after the Qaeda Azam's sad demise in 1948. He became uh, 
1943, he became the deputy leader of the Muslim League Party in the Central Legislature, of which uh, Mr. Jinnah was the leader. In 1945, he became the chairman of the Central Parliamentary Board and, uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan's uh, great efforts uh, basically is to uh, give a central driving force to the Muslim League politics and uh, he is one of those who has given the most economic sacrifice for the making of Pakistan. He was not an ordinary man, he was a very, very rich person and he lost uh, and, for, and himself had forgone everything for Pakistan. It is said that uh, at the time of, uh, and this is not uh, validated by some by too many sources, at the time of Pakistan he just bought in a, about 70, 80,000 or 80,000 perhaps rupees into Pakistan from all his jagis and so on which is a very small amount and the, by the time of his death he probably had just a few thousand left. He had obviously a princely type of lifestyle and that basically accounts for the uh, rapid loss of the uh, financial resources. Uh, he became the first Prime Minister of Pakistan on 15th of August 1947 and uh, the, he paid visits to Egypt, Syria, Iraq and Iran and was enthusiastically welcomed and at his invitation in the spring of 1950 the Shah of Iran came to Pakistan and made an extensive journey, journey of the country. 1949 is very important in the history of Pakistan because this is the year of objectives resolution. An objective resolution is basically those founding principles on which all constitutions of Pakistan will be based. And uh, it is basically just a document of enshrining the uh, the attachment of Pakistan to the Islamic ideology. In 1950, he visited United States at President Truman's invitation, and uh, he also visited Canada. In 1950, uh, when things were very hot between India and Pakistan and a lot of massacres had already occurred of the Muslims and there was also the Kashmir war. He did something which uh, later on was repeated by Jana Zia that at the height of the tension with India, uh, Nehru flew, flew to Delhi to prevent a clash and it was successful and that resulted in the famous Lyakat Nehru Pact on April the 8th, 1950, which basically want, also wanted to protect the rights of minorities in the respective countries. Uh, the subject of uh, my, this current post is what was the politics of Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan uh, versus the big powers of the world. Uh, it is generally said in ordinary media that uh, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was uh, uh, somehow he chose between uh, USSR and uh, and the USA and thus set the uh, Pakistan's uh, future foreign policy. It is correct that Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan set up many things 
in the beginning. He was the one who steered the country after the death of uh, Mr. Jinnah. And uh, my days, it is generally said that Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was himself uh, not a healthy man at this age, and he probably had some heart disease, uh, which was uh, somewhat significant. Uh, if uh, the records and the and the things are correct, uh, my personal impression is that uh, it is only the later day historians who uh, just uh, think that in the poly in the times of 1947, 8, 51, and there were two powers: one is Russia, and the other is USA. This is not really fully correct. Uh, Britain was not yet a completely dead power. It still had colonies in many parts of the world, and it was quite active in this part of the world as well. It is said that uh, in the closing years, Liaquat Ali Khan did not have very good relations with the UK ambassador what was High Commissioner to Pakistan, as Pakistan was in the Commonwealth. And uh, he preferred that uh, uh, somebody else uh, would, uh, like Chaudhry Muhammad Ali, would deal with that person. There is a book by Mr. Noor, uh, who was a PA to uh, one of the earliest uh, ministers of Pakistan and uh, who was at that time ambassador to Iran and uh, there is also there was also a tribute by Palestinian uh, Mufti of Palestine uh, which basically showed that uh, uh, it appeared that uh, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan, on one hand, wanted to move Pakistan away from the United Britain, as Great Britain, as they used to call them, what is UK now. And at the same time, he wanted to develop better relationships with the new rising power, the USA. And he was one of the first to realize the rising importance of China. So Pakistan recognized China quite early on compared to other countries. Many of the countries, many countries of the world did not recognize People's Republic of China. They instead recognized Taiwan, uh, who were in the American bloc, uh, till the time when USA itself recognized uh, People's Republic of China, and that was quite late, that was 1970s. Uh, so, what did the foreign policy of Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan really was? If we go by Noor Ahmed Noor, it appears uh, that uh, Liaquat Ali was taking interest in the Middle Eastern politics and in the neighboring Iranian politics in the sense that he was siding with the Arab cause and the Iranian cause regarding the uh, preservation of their uh, resources for themselves, the oil in case of Iran and the uh, issue of uh, uh, the Suez and other issues in case of uh, Egypt and so on. And he seemed to be a very strong believer in the Palestinian cause. Uh, there's a speech of Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan. In the speech on, in Gujarawala on March the 18, 1951, Yaqat Ali Khan said as follows, Pakistan is neither tied to the apron strings of the Anglo-American bloc, nor is a camp follower of the communist bloc. 
It steered clear of the inter-bloc rivalry and has absolute independent foreign policy. Pakistan has all along been uninfluenced by the inter-bloc struggle and has supported the cause which is considered to be just. The record of the United Nations debate bear a testimony to this fact. Sometimes we agreed with the Western bloc and sometimes with the Communist bloc and as the situation and the matter under discussion demanded. Pakistan can pursue an independent course because it is not under the obligation of any foreign country. We have not been given assistance by any country of the world and whatever we have achieved have been through our own resources. Therefore, the question of subservience in foreign policy does not arise. Now, this is a very clear uh, testament to what Liaquat Ali Khan had got in mind. Interestingly, he quoted in this speech the instance of non-devaluation by the Pakistan government and asked his foreign policy critics whether it was possible for Pakistan to stick to this decision had her policies not been independent of foreign influence. Commonwealth had devaluate, devalued currency except Pakistan and another Commonwealth country. The fact that Pakistan vindicated her non-devaluation decision has proved that the policy of Pakistan were uninfluenced by any consideration other than the public will. Uh, <coughs> and he also wanted the establishment of International Islamic Economic Conference and Pakistan's leading role uh, in that sphere. So, with this, you know, uh, for any reasonable person, it would uh, be very clear that Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan uh, did not have any type of subservience uh, in question in his mind. It is said that when the language rights occurred in Pakistan, uh, what is now called Bangladesh, <clears throat> Lakhat Ali Khan conferred with the East Pakistani political leaders and he said, well, if, uh, do you want independence? Uh, if, if that is what you want, some kind of arrangement can be done. Uh, but the Bengalis, you know, they knew very well that there is India on the other side. And uh, uh, generally speaking, their political uh, uh, internal politics in Bengal and their various uh, uh, political parties, uh, they, they, they had a kind of their own type of politics and uh, um, the central government of Liaghat Ali Khan may or may not uh, interfere in that as long as there is no law and order issue or any issue concerning India and the, uh, and the union with Pakistan basically meant an added strength against any future adventures by India because we should remember that at that time uh, China was still in the flux and there was war going on there and it could not exert uh, any influence uh, 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 regarding the East Pakistan. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, it, it, he understood the voluntariness of the union of Pakistan between East and West Pakistan and that showed that he tried to solve everything politically and often uh, to a satisfaction of uh, most of the parties. Uh, when he died, there have been uh, many uh, uh, condolences from all over the world and uh, some of the condolences uh, are interesting uh, because uh, they show the stature of uh, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan. So Mr. C. R. Etli, the former Prime Minister of England said upon the death of Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan that I had the pleasure of cooperating with Liaquat Ali Khan on so many occasions 
when we were both Commonwealth Prime Minister. I was always struck by his wise and tolerant outlook. I admired the skill with which he handled the building of the new state of Pakistan. I regard him as a friend with whom one could converse freely on word problems. It was a great pleasure to my wife and myself to offer hospitality to him and his charming wife. Pakistan and the word has lost a great statesman. Now, uh, this is not all. Uh, the Christian Science Monitor on the death of Mr. Liaquat wrote, The assassination of Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan is a blow to Pakistan, to Islam and the West. For his own country, it means the loss of his leading statesman, a moderating influence in a region where religious and nationalistic passions run high, an able spokesman for his nation's cause. For Islam, it means another victory for the extremist fanaticism which would betray the best in the Muslim tradition and which threatens to set the whole Muslim world in self-destructive flames. For the West, it removes one of the Asian leaders who best understood the Western position, the nature of the communist threat and the necessity for the cooperation of the free world both within and without the United Nations. Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was everybody's person, so it is appropriate that uh, I should uh, uh, state what uh, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Palestine, said of him. Pakistan and Muslim world have lost in the person of Liaquat Ali Khan a great man and illustrious champion who was in the forefront of the most distinguished men of the Islamic world and eminent champions who were struggling for the renaissance of the modern Islam and its liberation from the fetters of imperialism. The loss of this titanic leader of incomparable acumen and vast experience has been more detrimental for Islam, especially as his death occurred at this most critical junction, which Pakistan and the whole world were traversing, especially as the death occurred only three years after the death of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. I came to know of Liaquat Ali Khan when he was working for the liberation and establishment of Pakistan with the Qaeda Azam, and I also saw him several times during his passage through Cairo on the way to Europe and America in the service of Pakistan and the Muslim world. I noticed that he was a man of keen intellect, of profound sentiment, of an exceptional personality. He dedicated all his efforts and talents for the service of Islam. My acquisition with him rose and deepened when I was in Pakistan for the last time. During that visit, I spent three months and saw the late leader on several occasions. My faith in his sincerity and capacity were thereby heightened, while my appreciation of his talents and attainments were enhanced. It was on account of these that he was selected to take the place of qaid azam and assume the position of the national leader and prime minister. He stood firm and unfaltering during all crises that his country was destined to face. He carried the standard of Islam high in Asia. His name will be, ever be illustrious in the annals of history and his name will ever be remembered for his wise and sound policy which will be followed by his successor at the helm of the state. And uh, <clears throat> he was uh, supposed to uh, make a detailed journey uh, of uh, these uh, Middle Eastern countries, which was also revealed in one of the uh, things. Now, the question arises that once uh, we have established that Liaquat Ali Khan was basically all men to all people and he was... Uh, Uh, somewhat closer to non-alignment rather than uh, any power block. Uh, whether he was popular in Punjab during his prime ministership 
uh, is a separate question. Actually, what happened was that uh, when uh, Liaquat Ali Khan Sahab uh, assumed office as Prime Minister, and before that, it was not envisaged either by Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan or Mr. Jinnah or by many other people that there would be so much bloodshed during the creation of Pakistan, that is subdivision of India, and there would be such whole-scale massacres, and this would be followed by an atmosphere of distress, and uh, uh, people uh, will migrate in great numbers from one side to the other side, and uh, this was not really envisaged, and what was actually thought was that after the making of Pakistan, there will be about 15-20% Hindu and Sikh community in Pakistan, and Pakistan had adopted the Government of India Act 1935 as its first working type of constitution with slight amendments, and my personal view is that the a reason the constitution of Pakistan took time till 1956 uh, and uh, it started making constitution seriously in around 1954 uh, is basically uh, that there was this problem of uh, the parity between the share of East and West Pakistan. The East Pakistanis were obviously in majority uh, and West Pakistan about 56%, 44%, something like that. West Pakistan was in a minority. And uh, the second issue basically was that the state was not firmly established and uh, what was uh, the thing which was needed last was a Pandora box uh, uh, in which uh, every province is fighting for provincial autonomy. And, and mind it that at that time uh, there were many politicians, particularly in Bengal and particularly in the uh, Balochistan and especially in KPK, uh, who had close links uh, with outside forces. Uh, in KPK, after all, we should not forget that uh, Ghaffar Khan was a member of the Central Executive Council of the Indian National Congress and was opposed to the creation of Pakistan. And there were some others also. And in Balochistan, uh, there were forces. Uh, which were aligned with the outside forces, especially the uh, imperialistic Britain and so on. You know, there are certain uh, conspiracy theories about the assassination of Nawab Zada Khan. And uh, 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 the, the impression uh, which these uh, conspiracy theories try to make is that the Western bloc was ultimately somewhat unhappy uh, with the stance of Liaquat Ali Khan on the oil issues, particularly Iranian oil issue, nationalization issue, and the Egyptian uh, uh, issue which was, which was taking shape. And uh, uh, they were probably also unhappy with the constitutional uh, issue which is uh, the 1949 uh, uh, statement of principles which made Islamabad uh, Pakistan bind to the uh, principle of Islam in the constitution and all further constitutions. Uh, and, uh, and probably also because they might have felt, certain powers might have felt that Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan is more interested in USA uh, than in the in Britain, um, and it is not surprising that uh, one of the persons who killed Liaquat Ali Khan, the person who was supposed to who killed Liaquat Ali Khan, was had some type of uh, connection with the previous uh, uh, regimes uh, controlling. India and part of uh, uh, the border with Afghanistan. Um, there are even people who state that uh, uh, Saad Akbar, the man who killed, was once, uh, he was just practicing uh, on a wall and somebody asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'll kill the Prime Minister of Pakistan. 
and uh, he was practicing on the wall in Aptabad or some area like that. Well, there are stories like that. But uh, one thing which uh, is worth describing is the passage of uh, Sayyid Nur Ahmed's book from Martial Law to Martial Law and he is saying this is from 1919's Martial Law to 1958's Martial Law. I will read a few excerpts from this book and uh, then I will be closing uh, this with my own impression of the various issues that why Liaquat Ali Khan uh, has not been given the uh, position posthumously uh, of uh, after his death of uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, heroship which, which, which was deserved. And over the years there is uh, less and less tendency to talk of him because uh, that did not suit the politics of certain people. One of the probable reason is uh, that uh, Liaquat Ali Khan Sahib because of the unexpected uh, refugees coming from UP, CP and uh, these are his, like these were his electoral areas, this is where the uh, basic planning of the Pakistan future state used to be done and obviously those Muslims in India uh, they knew that uh, they will not be able to immigrate and mass in this small country uh, and yet they supported it for the sake of the Muslims in what is now the north that is the West Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously that meant you know that they would be recruited in the government service and uh, they will constitute a majority and uh, and it was only later when one unit was formed uh, that uh, the central government assumed the overall uh, responsibility and that increased more with the Yub Khan also. Uh, so that uh, the time had come in the early 60s uh, that the Pakistan was basically steered by the a combination of mostly Pashtun and some Punjabi generals along with uh, bureaucrats, uh, secretaries, uh, who were often from the, uh, were immigrants from India uh, and uh, had a base in Karachi. Uh, so that in 1971, uh, when the East Pakistan crisis uh, broke out, the, one of the things which accelerated this crisis was that the decision makers were the Pathan generals and the Udu speakers. And the Udu speakers uh, were very emotional about the kind of uh, uh, killing which uh, Mujib Rahman people had started doing from uh, February, January, February 1917 in the former East Pakistan. And they wanted some action. And incidentally, at that time, the heads of the um, uh, non Pashtun religious parties like Jamaat Islami, Jamiat Ulmai Pakistan, which at that time had good following, uh, they were also basically Urdu speakers from India. Uh, so there was, in 1971, there was basically a no moderating force in West Pakistan, uh, which was basically ruling the place, uh, which would say that, okay, let's go to talk to uh, the East Pakistani people and uh, their leaders. Uh, and there was a bit of emotionality. I personally feel that had the leadership been in control of the predominantly Punjabi people, uh, the, I think negotiation would have been the way with the East Pakistan. East Pakistan might not have separated. There might have been a new constitution. Uh, other thing was that uh, uh, he had his rivals during his lifetime, I think uh, Noab Mamdot and who had also immigrated from East Punjab and and so on, and uh, and and that and that uh, that was another issue. Uh, but uh, the most uh, thing, interesting thing, is that Nawab Zadar Liaquat Ali Khan, even though he was a very rich person, he would himself uh, uh, take the copies of Dawn and he would sell it to the um, um, put them at the places. Uh, where it can be distributed early in the morning and uh, he was one of the first one to make use of the word Qaidi Azam for Mr. Jinnah 
and uh, he had a he he had a this uh, um, spirit in him of uh, sacrificing all his property all his time and even his life uh, for the homeland of uh, pakistan for the muslims of uh, subcontinent and in fact you can say uh, that uh, you can say that uh, he was indirectly like mr jinnah the creator of not one islamic state but of two islamic states later on pakistan and bangladesh also uh, uh this brings me to the conspiracy theories once again that there were certain conspiracy theories that certain officers who were recruited by certain people of lochistan certain rulers and uh, who were not happy with mr liaquat ali khan and uh, they were the kind of people who really uh, wanted liaquat out and uh, might have been involved in hiring this uh, hired assassin said akbar and um, that type of thing um said akbar was killed on the spot and the various inquiries which were done later even that uh, airplanes you know they had mysterious accidents and uh, uh, it was basically there was there was a definitely a cover up of the liaquat ali khan's uh, murder but uh, Uh, the description cannot be complete without uh, the mention of Begum Liaquat Ali Khan. Begum Liaquat Ali Khan was an intellectual. There is no doubt about that. She was a very highly educated woman of her time, uh, and uh, she was the second wife of Liaquat Ali Khan and uh, Liaquat Ali Khan's uh, uh, progeny. Um, um, is is obviously uh, she had two sons. Uh, Begum Liaquat Ali Khan was also ambassador of after the death of uh, uh, Mr Liaquat Ali Khan she was also ambassador to many countries uh, for Pakistan and uh, controversially it is said that uh, she was shared with some of the socialistic descendants of uh, Mr Zulfikar Ali Bhutto uh, i don't know whether this is correct or not because if she was uh, one of the person supporting nationalizations of industries or anything like that uh, that was uh, i don't know but uh, it appears that uh, there was some personality conflict between fatima jinnah and begum liaquat ali khan and this is also probably one of the reasons that uh, because uh, the ayub regime did not want fatima jinnah to Uh, rise up that much and obviously ayub and uh, uh, liaquat uh, were obviously from different uh, type of backgrounds and uh, liaquat ali khan was obviously a a nawab zada you was uh, from a small you know middle class uh, family um, and uh, although you was selected over the head of others Uh, probably to the influence of Sikandar Mirza by Liaquat Ali Khan to become the first army chief of Pakistan. So that was another decision which had consequences. So Liaquat Ali Khan's decision to support Kaidia Mr Jinnah wholeheartedly from the very beginning as a supreme leader this was a very important decision. Uh, his letters to Jinnah to make sure that he comes back from UK uh, Britain was a very important decision in making of pakistan the decision of uh, ilama iqbal to make mr jinnah the life president of muslim league was a very important decision in making of pakistan then qarardad e muqasid the objective resolution was a very important decision by liaquat ali khan then giving funds to the military of pakistan very important decision the fighting in kashmir for the cause of pakistan very important decision the nehru nehru liaquat back to cool down the various things very important decision and uh, to recognize china was a very important decision at the time not to participate in the korean war uh, militarily was also a, a thing which is interesting uh, the decisions of mr liaquat ali khan 
over the fate and making of Pakistan is not small. Uh, there have been later attempts by the so-called uh, Urdu speakers uh, militaristic party, the MQM of Karachi to capitalize on his name and so on. Uh, but obviously this has not been appreciated because Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was obviously a national leader, he was not a sectarian leader or something. And, uh, and this uh, speaker, me, uh, I'm obviously not an Urdu speaker, so I don't belong to the stock to which Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan belonged. Um, at this point, uh, I would uh, uh, say that uh, should I read uh, the book for uh, passage of the book from Mr. Noor Ahmed. And uh, uh, this is a bit long, so uh, let me just start that. Allow me to quote from the book From Martial Law to Martial Law by Sayyid Noor Ahmed. It was published in 1985 by Vanguard Books Lahore. On page 313, it writes After the assassination of Yakat Ali Khan, that the last instructions Raja Ghazas Ali Khan had received from Liaquat were to prepare to return to Karachi for consultation on the proposed joint declaration of Pakistan, Iran and Egypt. After the sudden change, the Raja waited about a week. Then he sent a telegram to the new Prime Minister asking that the file be studied and new instructions sent to him about visiting Karachi. In reply, Raja Sahib received a telegram which said that the Prime Minister was very busy but would look into the subject at his earliest convenience. In the meantime, the tone of some official statements made in Karachi troubled him. The Foreign Minister Chaudhry Zafullah Khan was out of the country at the time of Lyakat's murder. On October 20, he returned to Karachi and took a new oath of office. There, during a press interview, Zafrullah said in response to a question about Iran and Egypt that the situation in each country was of concern to Pakistan and hoped that the disputes would be resolved in a peaceful manner. The next day, Khwaja Nazimuddin said almost the same thing and also looked for a peaceful solution. This seemed to be entirely different from the approach taken by Lyakat. The desire for peaceful mutual settlement is a noble thing, but it always benefits the party which is in possession of the thing in dispute. Had the government of Pakistan drafted its statement in consultation with Britain, it would have said the same. Ghazan Ali was anxious to learn the policy of the new government. He wanted to come to Karachi, but the Prime Minister was putting him off. At last, the Raja wrote that in addition to official matters, he wanted to come for personal reasons as well. If he should be granted a few days' leave and permitted to come at his own expense. Among receiving Upon receiving this, Khwaja Nazaruddin ordered him to come on official business and fixed a date for talks with him. Ghazanfar Ali met the Prime Minister and explained the background to the policy proposed by Liaquat and told him that if Pakistan did not go forward with the policy and fail to support Iran and Egypt at this critical stage, it would negate those factors which Pakistan had, which Pakistan had made cornerstone of its foreign policy. The talk was mostly a one-sided affair. The Raja states that his pleas had no effect on Nazimuddin. He then changed his tack and said that perhaps Pakistan could do some service to Britain while retaining its prestige among the Muslim countries and perhaps Britain would not disapprove if Pakistan made some statement in support 
uh, of uh, Iran and Egypt. If the Prime Minister considered it proper, he would ask the British how far Pakistan can go along these lines. Nazmuddin listened and said, yes, it might be possible. I will think about it. Thereafter, the government of Pakistan said nothing in support of Egypt and Iran, which might clash with the views of the British. Quite to the country, India, also a member of Commonwealth, came forward a month later to support Egypt. Nehru declared in a press conference that wave of national liberation among people of the East deserved the sympathy of India. So basically this uh, passage sh uh, shows that there was a radical shift of foreign policy of Pakistan after Liaquat Ali Khan. Liaquat Ali Khan's foreign policy incorporated the presence of Pakistan, continued presence of Pakistan in the Commonwealth, but it uh, basically was a non-aligned policy, although he was uh, observing the power change which was occurring in the world. Uh, this presentation of mine uh, is slightly jumbled because this is not based on a a, a observation which is a personal observation unlike the uh, podcasts about you Yahya Bhutto Zia uh, whom this uh, person has himself seen alive during their times and uh, one of the difficulties in retracing any meaningful history is that uh, it is always a conjecture. And uh, with this, uh, uh, we are left with only one or two aspects of uh, Nawab Zada Liaquat Ali Khan, and that is uh, his uh, family life. Lakat Ali Khan was uh, a thorough family man and uh, uh, his uh, uh, marriage with uh, uh, Rana Lakat Ali uh, has some political import. This was not followed by uh, any contact and, uh, and uh, somewhat later on uh, later on when Mr. Liagat Ali Khan was uh, elected uh, to the to become the vice president of the UP Legislative Council, um, uh, she wrote uh, uh, an epistle to Mr. Liakat congratulating him. And uh, so it was with this uh, uh, issue, and then there was some uh, link. 
And in December 1932, Ms. Pan tendered her resignation to the college and moved to the Maidan Hotel, Delhi. The marriage took place in April 1933 in a small room where the elder brother of Liaquat Ali Khan, Nawab Sajjad Ali Khan, was present. The Imam of the Jamia Masjid and Mr. Advani, her co-professor, Miss Miles and Sir Manakshi Dadabhoy, President of the Council of State in Delhi, also attended. Before the Nikah took place, Rona firmly embraced Islam as a religion. And before that, she belonged to a Brahmin family, but which had converted to Christianity. Uh, after um, the formation of Pakistan, Liaquat Ali Khan was obviously a good singer also, and he was also a captain of the school cricket team. Uh, so he was quite a outward type of person, uh, a kind of uh, appearance uh, which he gives is that of a, a academician, but he was obviously a all-rounder in everything. There is uh, finally, uh, there is much uh, talk uh, in certain circles about uh, uh, the uh, that uh, uh, a good deal has been written about the last moments of uh, Mr. Jinnah and uh, it is sometimes said that during Prime Ministership Mr. Jinnah's ambulance was just lying on the road and uh, there was nobody to look after and it's very hot and so on. It has been described. Uh, and a good deal has been written about the lack of consideration arrangement to receiving the ailing Qaid in Karachi on the last day of his life. Uh, I can join issue with Liaka's distractor on this score. I am reading from the book Liaka Al Khan, the builder of Pakistan. Uh, I was then the administrator of Karachi and my brother Sayyid Kazim, Kazim Raza was the inspector general of police. We were required uh, to be at the airport whenever Qaid Azam left or returned to Karachi. Both of us were completely unaware of his return to Karachi from Quetta on that fateful day. It was at 10.30 in the night that my telephone rang. At the other end was Lieutenant Commander Mazar Ahmed ADC to Governor General, who met his tragic death in air crash in Indonesia later on. He told me that Prime Minister wanted me at the Governor General's house forthwith. I wonder why the Prime Minister should call me to the Governor General's house since his own house was only a few yards away from mine. My heart sank when I entered the Governor General's house. The stillness of the atmosphere was oppressive. Mazhar Ahmed conducted me to the cabinet room where I saw the solitary figure of Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan with his head bent and with tears streaming down his face. As I entered the room, he looked up and said, Hashim Raza, Qaid Azam had just breathed his last. Inna alai wa inna alaihi rajoon. I have asked my ministers to gather here to select his successor. I want you to select the last residing place and inform Ikramullah, then our foreign secretary, who has to intimate the diplomats of the venue of the funeral prayers. Please request Ilama Shabir Ahmed Usmani to lead the funeral prayers. I could not resist the temptation of observing that as administrator of Karachi, I should be informed of his return to Karachi to enable my brother Sayyid Qasim Raza to make the necessary security arrangements. The Prime Minister told me no one except Colonel Nowles, military secretary to the Governor General, knew about the return of Qaid, and Colonel Nowles had strict in instruction from Miss Jinnah, uh, she's Fatma Jinnah, to keep the arrival as top secret. 
It was Colonel Niles who had ordered the ambulance, which unfortunately broke down on the way. So, with this, uh, I end this uh, very long uh, uh, interrupted talk about Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan. But uh, one thing which I must say is that the importance of Mr. Liaquat Ali in the creation of Pakistan, uh, along with Mr. Jinnah, uh, cannot be uh, underestimated and it cannot be suppressed. Just because the later on the politics of the provinces of Pakistan uh, was uh, not uh, towards the unity of the country and uh, later on uh, there were ethnic problems, but uh, the, the role of Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan is, uh, needs to be emphasized and it needs to be researched more. In uh, common uh, newspapers, generally they give the impression that if, as if Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan was a stooge of, of the USA or that he had uh, infuriated the Soviets of that time or that uh, another impression is that uh, uh, he was uh, instrumental in giving the control of Pakistan in the first 25 years to civilian control to immigrants from India or that uh, uh, he, uh, he, his wife was very much opposed to Miss Fatma Jinnah or something like that. But generally this is not the, uh, this is not what it is. What is more famous is and what was more famous during his lifetime was the big uh, closed fist, the Mukka, uh, which was displayed everywhere, Liaquat's Mukka, uh, which basically showed a firm determination to lead the country. And one of the first budgets of Pakistan was a surplus budget. And uh, he had good understanding of economics. And he also spent quite a bit in the early years of defense. And they say that when Shah of Iran visited Pakistan uh, during his tenure, he was a bit surprised at seeing the military armaments which Pakistan had gathered by that time. So, obviously, it is correct that Pakistan has got a, um, a a, a, a predominance uh, within its population of uh, uh, groups and uh, tribes and ethnic communities uh, which can be called uh, martial communities. For example, uh, the Jats are a martial race, the Rajputs are the famous martial race of India. And then uh, nowhere behind are the Balochis, the Pashtuns and uh, certain areas of Sindh, the Sindhis and so on, uh, which is one of the reasons that uh, Pakistan could survive in front of the might of India because it was inhabited by uh, people with militaristic uh, backgrounds at some time. With this, uh, thank you very much for your patience for listening to this long one about Kaide Milat Liaquat Ali Khan to which we owe quite a bit. <laughs>